ersten Mal Gast in der Böll Stiftung und äh, alle, die sich mit europäischer Migrations- und Integrationspolitik beschäftigen, ist ja ein Begriff. Ähm, nicht nur aus seiner akademischen Tätigkeit, er war Professor für Migration und äh, Integrationsstudien an der Erasmus-Universität Rotterdam, sondern auch aus seiner sehr umfassenden Tätigkeit als politischer Berater für die Europäische Kommission und eine ganze Reihe anderer internationaler Institutionen, unter anderem der International Labour Organization. So, ich freue mich auf Professor Enzinger. Bitte sehr. Good morning, everyone. I'm afraid that um, I shall have to disappoint uh, Mr. Fuchs a little bit, <laughs> although I will stick to my subject. <laughs> I will also uh, allow myself to make a few comments on uh, the MIPEX process in more general terms, but uh, I hope that uh, won't bother you too much. Uh, and it definitely is linked, I think, to the theme of uh, my presentation, uh, which, as you suggested, is uh, mobility aspirations versus uh, structural uh, barriers. Well, uh, let me first of all, um, I'm just starting straight away, thank you for the opportunity to talk to you again. It's not the first time, indeed, as you say, uh, that I'm uh, the guest of the Heinrich Böll Stiftung. And secondly, I would also like to congratulate uh, the um, uh, people responsible for uh, MIPEX 3 with the wonderful work they've done. And uh, although uh, what I'm going to say in the next few minutes may sound a little bit critical sometimes, uh, I'm well aware uh, that's easier to criticize uh, uh, such a massive uh, job uh, than to actually do it uh, and uh, in fact the main function as I uh, heard this morning also from uh, my uh, colleague Jan Nissen uh, of uh, MIPEX is in fact that it's a tool for debate. Well let's turn it into a tool for debate uh, with the intention obviously of improving policies and not only policies but also the uh, integration situation in all uh, countries uh, in included in the uh, MIPEX uh, exercise. All right, well, talking about MIPEX 3, um, I intend to say but a few things, but only a few things, on um, uh, each of the elements of MIPEX, that is on migrant, who is a migrant, on integration, what is integration, on policy, um, how to interpret this term, policies, and then on index, at least I assume the EX comes, is the last two letters of index, otherwise I couldn't figure out why MIPEX is called MIPEX, but uh, okay, <laughs> that's not too difficult. There we all agree, I think, all right. Um, the next, uh, after that, I will then link up some of the MIPEX findings to the actual theme of my presentation, which is MIPEX and integration processes, uh, mobility aspirations, there they are, uh, structural barriers, and I have also taken the liberty because I do think, and in fact uh, what uh, uh, my predecessor, uh, Mr. Ross, was saying already uh, is absolutely true. It's not just structural constraints, it's also cultural constraints or cultural um, uh, barriers uh, that may, um, uh, well, hamper, impede uh, integration processes, even though sometimes it is not so easy uh, to separate uh, structural and cultural constraints in real life. I mean, analytically, of course, it's a different story. <clears throat> okay, fair enough. So let's start with the question, who actually is a migrant? It's not a new question, obviously, and uh, it is a very difficult question, actually, uh, particularly if you're going to compare uh, 31 different countries because each of them in fact have their own definition almost of whom they uh, consider to be a migrant and obviously as we all know the basis for a sound comparison is at least that you uh, well the groups or the individuals that you are comparing are 
the same to the largest possible extent. <clears throat> That's for obvious reasons, given the variety in statistics, etc., is not always possible. And I do think that in reality the MIPEX people have made the best possible choice here uh, by uh, uh, opting for the, uh, what I tend to call the academic definition of migrant, that is a person, or immigrant rather, a person born in another country than the country where he or she is actually residing. In other words, a person who has migrated, that is an immigrant. In reality, however, when we look at the different policies we, uh, that have been studied, we must say two things. That is that not all immigrants are affected by the policies to the same degree. Uh, take, for example, uh, intra-EU immigrants um, uh, who may not be as affected as strongly as immigrants from outside the European Union in the member states. Um, in many cases, the second generation, which formally speaking is not a migrant, are still affected by the policies. That's another point. And there are also certain countries, and I'm thinking here of the uh, new member states, well, not so new anymore now, uh, in uh, Central and Eastern Europe, where many of, we, that have relatively few immigrants, but where many of the policies uh, that are under consideration are aimed at indigenous minorities. So here we are, what are we exactly comparing, who are the migrants? Uh, there's another factor also that is in some countries, uh, uh, well, only count migrants as people, that's not what the MIPEX people have done, uh, but sometimes data simply are not available uh, on this. And then you have to fall back on the available statistics which only include foreign citizens. And as we all know, not all foreign citizens residing in a country are migrants. And likewise, not all migrants residing in a country are foreign citizens, to complicate things even more. Um, it isn't always easy, I agree, and uh, once again, I think by taking foreign-born, um, uh, I, it's my feeling that they've made the best, cho made the best possible choice uh, as a basis of uh, comparison. Um, and uh, leaving aside, I didn't even mention that yet, the undocumented migrants, of course, who formally are not an object of integration policy for understandable reasons. Then there is a second uh, aspect which I think uh, uh, we should not overlook, that is uh, the relevance of the size of the migrant population. Um, I've checked that with the 31 MIPEX countries, um, if I'm not mistaken, Romania is the country with the smallest share of foreign-born people, that is 0.1% of the people living in Romania were born outside Romania, I assume quite a few in Moldova, but I'm not sure never mind, um, whereas the country with the largest immigrant share is Luxembourg, which has no less than 43% of its population born outside Luxembourg and of the somewhat bigger countries, uh, countries such as Switzerland and Canada are, uh, have a substantial share, over 20% of the population born abroad. And that matters, of course, uh, whether it's only an insignificant percentage or whether it's one-fifth or even more than one-third of your population which is an immigrant and affected, therefore, by the policies. And it has been said before, at the local level, of course, uh, there are situations where in cities, including the city uh, where I live and work, Rotterdam, where um, half of the resident population can be qualified as migrant, certainly if you include the second generation. And there are more cities in Europe which are like that. Uh, and that obviously makes a difference. Um, and then, Finally, there is one other well, aspect which I missed a little bit in the MIPEX um, uh, approach, that is the role of the resident population. We always say integration is a two-sided process. Well, many of the indicators, the bulk of the indicators, rather refer to the uh, situation of the migrants and uh, assuming that it's the migrants that make most of the steps, which actually is true, but the role of the resident population tends to be neglected a little bit marginalized in the system. All right, I'm moving on to what is integration. 
it shall be obvious to everyone, we're all experts after all in this field, the integration process does not exist. Integration has very many different uh, faces. Of course, we can talk about individual integration, we can talk about group integration, we can talk about an integrated society even, uh, but that's not precisely, it's, it's not the only aspect what, uh, that, what I mean. Um, ask anyone what he or she means by integration and you will get very many different answers. And of course that is also reflected in the MIPEX exercise but nevertheless uh, we may talk about institutional participation, huh? participation in work, in education, schooling, in the political system etc. etc. Uh, we may talk about acculturation, to what extent uh, has, is there well, a tendency towards a greater similarity in culture, in values, in behavioral norms. That includes very often knowledge of the language. We may talk about social contacts. Uh, with whom do uh, uh, people of migrant origin interact? Uh, do they stay in their own community or do they uh, well, cross borders, so to say, and relate to members of the resident population? And uh, which of these two do we refer to as integration, actually? Can someone be well integrated into his or her own community? That, I think, is also a question which comes up when we're discussing the concept of integration. And then, finally, where are the, someone's loyalties? That, too, is increasingly, in many European countries, uh, understood by integration. Uh, if if, if um, uh, I would just allow myself to make a very, very quick overview of what has been happening in Europe, say, in the past 10 to 20 years, we can see a clear shift from, uh, certainly in the older immigration countries in Europe, from uh, participation as the main objective of integration towards, uh, well, uh, acculturation and even shifting loyalties as a major demand which is asked from the migrants who uh, would like to integrate and uh, in many cases many people consider a migrant who has his or her loyalties with the, uh, the well, country with the society of which he is actually a part uh, as an integrated mi uh, migrant. Um, preferably forgetting about loyalties with the society from which the migrant originates. That's a major change that we have been witnessing over the past uh, 10 years and it's likely uh, to uh, continue. Now, uh, of course, it may, does make a difference, uh, it shall be obvious, whether it's an old or a new immigration country. And then uh, it's my feeling, even though it's nowhere expressed as clearly as here, uh, that in the MIPEX view, integration means equal rights and recognition of cultural heritage. That is obvious, and I, I, I couldn't agree more with that as a term of integration, but at the same time, I would like to note that uh, there are different views also that exist in Europe, and uh, there may be political views, differences between political parties, uh, there may be differences between different countries which traditionally have different models of integration. Um, this is only one view. It's, to me personally, a very sympathetic view, but it's not the only one view. We move on to the next step, which is policies. In MIPEX, um, we, um, they have been analyzing policy measures that are aimed at uh, promoting integration. Policy measures aimed at promoting integration. It has been said uh, before already this morning, but there are alternatives. Uh, it's only, or largely, about the policy measures. It's not about the policy outcomes. How effective are these policies? It's not always very easy to measure, of course, but uh, nevertheless, intentions do not always lead to, uh, well, actual change or actual the perceived outcomes. It's not about actual integration either. We can measure immigrant integration, obviously. Uh, that's another way, would have been another way of approaching it. Uh, what's the labor participation rate? What's the educational level attained? What's the political participation rate, etc.? cetera? Uh, that's an these are indicators of integration, but it's not what MIPEX um, has uh, done. Uh, 
Um, we could also talk about policy objectives. In fact, what I just said already, uh, well, alluded to that, um, that, there are different models in different European countries that are dominant, even though they may within one country, they may, the, the favorite model may change over the years. Uh, there are different models, and uh, the weight of each of the policy measures obviously demands, uh, depends on uh, the choice of that uh, particular uh, model. So in reality, there are more variables that possibly can be accounted for within one and the same uh, model. Um, but I would like you to be aware of the fact that in MIPEX it's the policy measures, it's not the outcomes, it's not the actual integration that um, has been uh, measured. And then of course MIPEX focuses on uh, national policies, uh, that's another choice which they for obvious reasons had to made, make, but uh, in many countries, and including obviously Germany, uh, quite a few measures uh, um, are taken not at a national, at the federal level, but at the level of the lender uh, or at the level of the cities and the municipalities. And uh, certainly in a country like Germany, we see a huge variety uh, in this respect. For example, also in educational policies uh, that uh, we, uh, as we discussed uh, uh, previously. Um, I think there's another aspect which we should keep in mind, that is that um, when uh, we're talking about public intervention in integration processes, and that's actually what we're talking about today, um, um, this intervention takes place in, one could argue that it takes place in three different areas, the legal area, the social and economic area, and the cultural area. But um, the possibilities in liberal democracies like ours, the possibilities for public authorities to intervene in each of these areas are quite different. I think they go furthest in the legal area because after all we have parliaments which legislate and laws are binding and everyone in principle has to observe the law, so it's pretty binding. In socio-economic area, the possibilities for intervention, for public intervention, are much more limited. And we should be aware of that, of course, if we study all sorts of measures. After all, all our countries are market economies, and it's the sort of interplay of supply and demand and the functioning of the market, which is rather decisive, uh, even though it can be, well, directed in one way or another uh, by certain government measures and by limited forms of government intervention. That is even more difficult in the cultural field because, uh, well, uh, we have all sorts of freedoms and uh, it's not the task of governments in Western democracies like ours to say, to tell the people what they should think and what they should uh, believe. Um, and uh, that's a little bit tricky precisely in an era, um, as I've said before, that we're now going through where loyalties, where culture, where cultural identification with the surrounding environment counts a lot more strongly as an indicator of integration than it did in the past. Uh, because governments can, can say so, but what can they do about it actually? And it's very hard for them to force people to think or believe in a certain way. Um, so that's another dilemma almost uh, which where, where, where uh, well, the actual thinking, the mainstream thinking on integration processes on the one hand and the possibilities and opportunities for uh, um, uh, government intervention, uh, in fact, tend to tend to clash a little bit. Uh, the opportunities are much more limited than some people would like to. Okay, finally, talking about the index, what does the index indicate actually? Um, and uh, without becoming too technical, because uh, the whole MIPEX uh, program will only be um, explained to you uh, this afternoon, um, I think um, it shall be clear to you that the index is composed of a very large number, roughly about 150 or so, different indicators. Now, um, a problem 
in, as I see it a little bit, is that uh, the weight of all these indicators is the same. Now, there is a possibility uh, to access uh, to the data sources, the databases used by MIPEX, where you can vary the weight of all the indicators yourself, but nevertheless, uh, you, the way, uh, well, uh, the MIPEX results have been published, of course, they're going to live their own lives and they're going to be picked up by the press and there is a press, uh, the, the media like rankings of countries, etc. In reality, I think we should keep in mind that the weight of each indicator may vary. Some indicators, all of us will find some indicators more important than others. The trouble is that not everyone will find the same indicators the most important ones, of course, and that is the same with countries. Countries differ in their policy objectives and therefore in, they would also differ in their choice of their favorite indicators. <clears throat> they may differ in the phase of integration process. It shall be obvious that um, in um, a situation where uh, a country has a long immigration tradition uh, and a lot of experience also with uh, integration policies and successes and failures of integration policies, that the situation is quite different uh, from the situation in a brand new immigration country where everything is new and very often the wheel uh, will be invented again. But talking about these policy objectives, for example, let's take the example of the United States, uh, where traditionally uh, the public authorities have hardly made any effort to promote actual integration. The belief in the U.S. for a very long time has been that it's the labor market which is the major integration machine, and uh, there are some, anti some strong anti-discrimination measures, but that's just about all. About all. No special integration policies for certain communities or whatsoever. Um, no wonder that uh, the U.S. has a good score on accessibility of the labor market and a poor score on welfare provisions. In some European countries, it's rather the other way around. Good welfare provisions for uh, people of migrant origin and, as a consequence, there's a whole economic reasoning behind it, which I will uh, skip now, but as a consequence, poorer opportunities in the labor market. This reflects deliberate choices, of course, and it's differences, it reflects differences in choices of objectives of uh, public policies. Likewise for naturalization versus voting rights. There's an interesting example which is Belgium uh, where there have been long debates on voting rights for immigrants not the only country of course in Europe I uh, know that in Germany the same has, is the case. Um, in, uh, at the end of that debate uh, the idea that migrants should be given foreigners should be given the right to vote in uh, local elections was rejected, but to compensate for that, uh, uh, naturalization policies were very much relaxed uh, in order to encourage as many foreigners as possible to become Belgian citizens. That is an approach, and as a consequence, Belgium scores very highly on naturalization and very low on voting rights, yet at the same time, through this naturalization, uh, many more immigrants have obtained voting rights. So I'm trying to explain some of the complexities of uh, the work uh, uh, MIPEX no doubt has been uh, faced with. Yeah. And there's another aspect, which is the pre-existing public arrangements, uh, by which I mean that traditionally in some countries, uh, some instruments are favored uh, in order to encourage well, uh, uh, social cohesion, uh, to encourage integration. Some countries like France, for example, opts, tend to, tends to opt for education, which is very much state-dominated. Whereas in other countries, uh, take for example the Netherlands, uh, housing uh, has a very uh, large social housing sectors and no wonder that the government has tried to incorporate uh, newcomers precisely by making available good housing to them, which in fact has been quite successful. So the choice also depends on the possibilities. To sum up, very few MIPEX indicators ref uh, refer to the role, I've said that before anyway, uh, 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 already to the role of, of the local population. Uh, now to sum up a conclusion on the MIPEX methodology and then I'll move on to the second part. MIPEX has made choices that have produced a ranking, but with different choices the ranking would have been different. <laughs>
and uh, uh, again with all due respect to the MIPREX people because uh, you have to make choices otherwise it's impossible to make comparisons uh, and fruitful and necessary and useful comparisons as they've done but I think it's good to be aware that if other choices had been made uh, the ranking might have been different in some places. All right, uh, now I'm making a bridge from the MIPEX indicators, which are very useful, of course, in understanding the uh, uh, mobility aspirations and the structural variance. And let's first uh, talk a little bit about the mobility aspirations among migrants. And uh, in fact, like my colleague Professor Ross, I'm referring here to Bourdieu, uh, but uh, a different uh, part of uh, Bourdieu. Um, uh, in fact, um, what are the determinants of uh, mobility aspirations? My, uh, let's say, I think it's, it's, it's obvious, it, it, comes, it comes out of all research that uh, migrants have strong aspirations. Already the simple fact that they've migrated uh, very often reflects a strong will. Uh, otherwise, most people would not have migrated. A will towards well, first geographic mobility and then upward social mobility. And those who cannot achieve that for whatever reason in the first generation sort of transfer this willingness to their children to uh, the second generation. And uh, therefore, there's no reason to doubt about the mobility aspirations among migrants and also among their children, among young migrants. Yeah. The elements, in fact, which play a role here are, and there's Bourdieu, um, the human, what he calls uh, human capital, that is education and uh, skills. Um, what indeed we observe is that uh, the second generation is doing, uh, are doing substantially better in schools although there are some indicators uh, which, well, uh, in fact, uh, 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 well, tend to indicate the opposite. Uh, referring here to the PISA data, just refer to Ross, but participation, the level of participation, you didn't mean that, you were talking about the, the results, and there I agree, I mean, PISA data don't lie, um, but uh, the degree of participation, the, the percentage of people of migrant origin, migrant background, who attend higher forms of education, in fact, uh, are a lot higher in the first and in the second generation than they were in the first generation. So there's definitely uh, upward mobility. School successes, indeed, uh, tend to be uh, more limited. Uh, maybe that's something for the third generation, but uh, there may be other explanations factors. Well, you were uh, uh, um, mentioning a few, and uh, I will in a moment perhaps add uh, a few more. Um, but uh, um, overall, the average level of school attendance, the, the average level of school uh, um, uh, the, the, the achievement of, 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 of schooling uh, is definitely going up, and so is the level of skills, which is good. And in fact, they're catching up in comparison with the nature Native population, even though the native level of the native of schooling of the native populations is also going up, uh, they're catching up. The gap is getting narrower. Uh, on the other hand, as immigration is continuing, um, uh, it, uh, uh, there are always new uh, people entering of, uh, with relatively low skills. Again, new immigrants. Um, the social capital is equally important. Of what network, networks um, does someone have? What contacts does someone have? Because these, these help uh, gaining access to opportunities, gaining access to jobs, uh, etc. Of course, it's cultural capital, the linguistic qualities, linguistic abilities, uh, which also play a role, familiarity with the dominant culture. And finally, that's not quite Bourdieu, but it's sometimes added to what he said, the economic capital, the financial means that someone possesses. No wonder that highly skilled people who tend to enter our countries in larger numbers than before nowadays, who are usually more well-to-do, have much better opportunities, possibilities for integration and uh, of course migrant, many migrants, those migrants who become entrepreneurs because they do possess a certain capital always, uh, oft, often tend to be quite successful as well. 
So here, so far for the mobilities. Now, the mobility obviously does not always lead to a full and satisfactory degree of participation because there are these structural barriers. Well, what are they, very briefly again, in view of the time also? Um, first, there is obviously the business cycle. In some periods, uh, it's better, it's easier for newcomers, it's also easier for established migrants uh, to gain access to the labor market than in other periods, depending on the economic situation. Migrants tend to be seen and tend to function as a buffer in the labor market. Uh, they are uh, very often their last in and their first out, their last in when they're needed and first out when they're no longer needed. That's one. The second is the legal restrictions. Obviously, there are immigration rules which uh, may make it more difficult for migrants to participate, to integrate, uh, for example, rules concerning family reunification. There are also citizenship rules uh, or, or uh, well, opportunities, access to citizenship is limited, um, ha is subject to certain rules, and uh, there are forms of participation which are reserved to citizens of a country in many states, not only voting rights but also so access to the labor market, to certain types of jobs, for example. Um, and there is, of course, also the labor legislation. Uh, I already mentioned the principle of last in, first out, uh, which uh, structurally affects migrants more than um, the uh, native uh, population. Um, another more sociological rather than legal factor is the segmentation of societies. Um, our labor markets, our cities, our, our schools are all segmented. And once you're part of one segment, it's not so easy uh, to go over to another segment. Once you're born and raised in one neighborhood, it's not so easy to move to another neighborhood. Once your father or your mother works in some um, uh, area of, 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 of industry, field of industry, it's not so easy. There's a lot of research evidence of this uh, to move to another one. That's what we call the reproduction of someone's social status. And Professor Ross was also briefly referring to it. It is something which really can be seen as a structural barrier for a full participation by people of immigrant descent. Then we move to racism, uh, already mentioned, obviously, for obvious reasons by uh, Professor Ross as well. It's uh, racism which could be interpreted and manifest itself in the form of prejudice. You could call it the cultural gap. You could talk about the cultural bias which is inherent to many of our systems, uh, not always consciously, perhaps, but uh, which is part of that. And those who are less familiar with uh, the dominant culture have a handicap, may have a handicap here under certain conditions, and hence the plea also by Professor Ross to adapt these systems to the largest possible extent. But the dilemma, of course, is to what extent can we adapt these systems? Are we willing, not only willing to adapt the systems, but also and even able to adapt the systems? And finally, and there is a link, of course, with racism here, there is discrimination, particularly in selection mechanisms, um, uh, because that has been treated quite extensively also by Professor Ross. I will skip to my last slide now, which is about the cultural constraints. And there, in the last few minutes, I will say a few things about my own research findings in Rotterdam. Uh, we did a longitudinal research, actually, um, uh, over the past 10 years in the city of Rotterdam among two, the two largest immigrant uh, communities, uh, those of Turkish and those of Moroccan uh, origin, also present in quite a few other European countries. Uh, it was young people uh, between the age of 18 and 30, and uh, we did two surveys at two different moments with an interval of about seven or eight uh, years. Um, and uh, we asked uh, our respondents all sorts of things about their conditions of life, but even more so about their views on many things such as religion, uh, national identification, uh, friendships, uh, and uh, value orientation, all sorts of things that 
are not always so easy to, well, to, to ask and to interpret. It's much easier to ask, of course, where people work and um, what education they've had. Um, and uh, we found some interesting findings which I think tell you quite a lot about cultural constraints which can without any doubt be generalized to a large extent to other groups, other countries uh, also. What we found was that over the past years, over the past 10 years, the past decade, um, so uh, during the noughties, yeah, uh, the integration process has advanced by almost any indicator. You remember I gave you the indicators in the beginning. It has advanced by almost any indicator. Um, indeed, we could argue that particularly the second generation has become much more integrated. To what extent than 10 years ago? To what extent that is due to policies uh, is very hard to say. But um, I'm sure that even without these policies, integration process would have advanced. But at the same time, we have observed that the demands by the native population and the idea of what an integrated immigrant is has also changed and the demands are much higher now than they were 10 years ago and that is felt both by the native population and by the immigrants and um, as a consequence uh, well th that for obvious reasons leads to certain frustrations among the immigrants now we're doing our best and we're making an effort to integrate and yet it is not good again because the uh, definition of what on average the native population sees as um, uh, integration uh, has also changed. An interesting illustration here is linguistic capacities. Um, the, uh, one of the things we found that in spite of the substantial rise in educational levels, uh, the self-reported uh, knowledge of the Dutch language among the Turkish and Moroccan respondents has decreased. So the level of knowledge of Dutch has gone down. That's very unlikely because the share that, that it's really, we, we, we asked them to report it themselves. We didn't measure it in any way. Um, uh, I'm sure that if we had measured it, something the outcome would have been very different uh, because given the immense rise in the level, level of, ed, of, of, of education, you would expect that the linguistic capacities would have gone up as well. Um, not in their own perception. Uh, they all said, on average, and significantly, that their knowledge of Dutch had decreased, um, which is peculiar. It's hard to interpret, hard to understand, but we assume that they feel that the demands by their environment has gone, have, have even gone up more than their knowledge of, of Dutch. And also, at higher professional levels, obviously, uh, you need a more sophisticated level of linguistic abilities. So um, uh, there's some interesting dilemmas, some interesting paradoxes here, actually, yes. A second finding is that um, the uh, value, the change in value orientation over the past 10 years no doubt reflects acculturation, except in religion. There is a strong awareness of, 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 of religion, and in the field of religion, Islam, in the case of Turks and Moroccans, uh, in fact, not so much has changed. Um, but otherwise, in their values, uh, in their orientations, and also in their behavior, they have become uh, much more, well, uh, Dutch, so to say, much more accustomed to the mainstream Dutch values or Rotterdam values uh, than they were uh, 10 years ago. One interesting, uh, just one interesting example, choice of spouse. 10 years ago, the majority still argued that the parents should at least have some say in this. Uh, right now, it's only an insignificant majority, minority of the people in their 20s who say uh, that uh, the um, uh, parents uh, should have a say in the choice of their spouse. And indeed, what we have observed over the past 10 years is that the number, the percentage of uh, Turkish and uh, people of Turkish and Moroccan descent who recruit, who find a spouse in the country of origin has gone down dramatically. That reflects a shift in orientation, but it's also a product of stricter immigration policy for family migration. I'm, I'm about to finish. <laughs> um, so, um, in fact, uh, and yet at the same time, uh, asked how wide the cultural distance is um, in terms of how willing are you to accept cultural difference, how willing are you to be friends, to become friends with somebody of a different cultural background. Um, 
we see that both at the side of the native population, but also at the side of the immigrants, there is less willingness. The number of intercultural friendships has remained rather constant, constant, whereas given the rise of educational level and given the increased likelihood of migrants uh, who uh, to meet, uh, because at higher educational levels you're more likely to meet natives, uh, to meet natives, it is surprising that the number of friendships, of intercultural friendships, has not gone up. So they tend to withdraw a little bit at either side in their own circles, and we call that segregation. And I personally do not think that that is a good development. So, and then this is my final comment, notwithstanding a considerable progress in uh, migrant integrations, when you actually ask the different migrants about their expectations for the future, uh, they're much more negative, they're much gloomier uh, than they were 10 years ago. And uh, the difference between the native population and the population of immigrant descent becomes wider as the educational level goes up. And that too is surprising because we always think that education is a very good instrument of integration, of well, satisfying needs, of making people happier, making them uh, more um, uh, positive about their future. Uh, that's what it does. More highly educated are more positive about the future than less highly educated, but at the same time, and that's the intriguing thing, the gap between natives and non-natives widens in their expectations about the future as the educational level goes up. So perhaps we're confronted here with uh, what in women's studies is called the glass ceiling. Uh, um, there are expectations and the expectations simply at the rising expectations of upward mobility uh, 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 the aspirations cannot be fulfilled. They can only be fulfilled up to a certain level because then people of migrant origin bumped uh, well, into a ceiling and uh, that uh, apparently is quite frustrating to them. So after all, it's uh, rather much a sort of mixed picture that I'm able to, to, do, to depict here. There are certainly mobility aspirations. There is upward mobility taking place, uh, but at the same time, there's still very many barriers to overcome, structural as well as cultural. Thank you very much for your attention.